This program is brought to you by the Martin F. Weber Company, Michael's Stores, Hobby Lobby, and A.C. Moore, providing a variety of arts and crafts supplies, and by participating members of the national team of Bob Ross Instructors. The following program is a high-definition production of Blue Ridge PBS. Hi, I'm certainly glad you could join me today. You ready to do another fantastic painting with me? You recognize his iconic image. Who's this? This is Bob Ross. This is the most famous painter in the history of the universe. Signature phrases. A happy little cloud that floats around and just has fun all day. And soothing voice. Anything that you want, you can build here. This is your world. Bob Ross is one of public television's most beloved personalities. The Bob you see on the show is the Bob that we all knew even behind the scenes. I used to watch Bob Ross all the time and I, uh, the thing I remember was his positivity. Um, he made you want to do that. He wasn't only a painter, he was an entertainer in his own right. Without any flash, his painting spoke for him and he kind of took you by the hand and led you along the way. I talk to only one person when I'm filming and I'm I'm really crazy about that person. Some watched for his easy to learn painting technique. When I, I watch his method, I go, it, it is, wow, how does he do that? It's amazing. And uh, he makes it look incredibly easy. But the interesting thing is that when people actually try to do it, they have success. Once you have the technique down, all you need is a dream in your heart and the desire to put it on canvas. And some were just captivated by his calming demeanor. And I think maybe that's part of the magic. I, I think his voice was part of it, his presence, his manner, his uh, tone. Uh, I think his sincerity came across, and I think people relate to that. They still relate to that. Every legend has an intangible you know, aura or something. And I just imagine whenever you're uh, encompassed with greatness, you know, people just want to be around it. Bob Ross is public television's most recognizable artist. Everybody knows Bob Ross and especially his hair. This is the story of a young painter with a dream to share the joy of painting with everyone. My father, he spent most of his time when he came home from work watching public television. <laughs> he would have us watch Bob Ross where we would learn how to paint and learn how to use our imagination. I'm sure the word magic gets used a lot, but I mean, it really is like magic. I mean, he'd mix up his, you know, color, and I'm gonna take a little bit of this yellow and stick it in this black, and you're thinking, what? Why yellow and black? You're like, that's so counterintuitive. And then takes like a, a palette knife and gets a little thing and whoosh, whoosh, and there's a tree. And it's like, Matt, it's like, how'd you do that? People continually say, I can't draw a straight line. I don't have the talent, Bob, to do what you're doing. That's baloney. Talent is a pursued interest. In other words, anything that you're willing to practice, you can do. This is Bob Ross, the happy painter. But before Bob became one of the most popular artists on television, Robert Norman Ross was just a boy from Daytona Beach, Florida. He was born on October 29, 1942, and grew up in the Orlando area. Each of Bob's parents helped shape his life in critical ways. His father, Jack, was a builder. I used to be a carpenter years ago. My father was a carpenter, and he, and he taught me that trade. And I tell you what, it isn't that easy to make a shed on a, on a barn. He lost a finger helping his father. When there's, there's a pallet shot, you can see the missing finger. But because it was on his left hand and not his right hand, it didn't affect his ability to hold the brush. Blender brushes are very, very soft. As my father used to say, they're tender as a mother's love. And in my case, that was certainly true. I'm very prejudiced, but I think I had the greatest mother there was. She had the largest influence on him. She's the one who taught him the love of wildlife. 
Second to painting, or maybe even more than painting, Bob loved wildlife. I think when I was a kid, I must have had every kind of pet imaginable. I lived in Florida, so I had access to a lot of creatures, but I had a pet snake. Man, he got out of the cage and was lost in the house for a long time. My mother got up, went to the bathroom one night, and he was in there and scared her. But Bob's childhood wasn't all that easy. Bob says that they were not wealthy, and really, I think he viewed these wild animals, anything he could get his hands on, as toys and entertainment. His mother and father separated when Bob was very young. His mother remarried briefly and had another son, Bob's brother, Jim. When I was a kid, I used to sit around and you know, my brother and I, we'd look at clouds and we'd pick out all kinds of shapes. We'd see the mean old witch or the, or the candy man or whatever. 20 years later, Bob's mom married his dad again, but they didn't have long together. Bob's father died soon after they remarried. School was also tough for Bob. Do these little X's, see? Little X's. There. That's just the way the teacher used to grade my paper in school. She just run across it and go. Ch -ch 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 -ch. When he was just 18 years old, Bob joined the Air Force. I spent half my life in the military, and I used to come home, take off my little soldier hat, put on my painter's hat. He got married and had a son, Stephen. He has been painting, I think, since he was born. He was about 12 years old before he realized everybody didn't paint. But Bob soon found himself raising a son on his own. His first marriage didn't last long. Bob and his son had a close relationship, and years later, after the Joy of Painting series took off, Steve would occasionally appear on the program and eventually became a certified Ross instructor himself. Steve travels all over the country teaching hundreds and hundreds of people the joy of painting. And I've asked Steve to come in today and show you what he can do in just a few minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve and I'll be back at the end of the show. Steve? Thanks a lot, Dan. Steve was incredibly talented. Bob said he talks better than I do and he paints better than I do, but Steve never um, was someone we could convince to come on and work with the show. And I always regretted that because I thought he had enormous talent. Bob and Steve lived in Florida for several years until the military transferred them to Alaska when Steve was a young boy. I had been born and raised in Florida and was 21 years old before I ever saw snow. Bob remarried and settled down near Fairbanks, Alaska with his new wife, Jane. She was a civilian worker with the Air Force. For more than a decade, Bob worked mainly as a medical records technician at the Air Base Hospital and cultivated his love of painting. He was inspired by the snow-capped mountains that surrounded him and sold his paintings to tourists. He was a part-time bartender and he was painting gold pans in Alaska and selling them in the bar to make money. One day, the tavern's television was tuned to a PBS station. Bob looked up and saw a painting show hosted by a German man named Bill Alexander. How long can you hold a dream? How long can you have creative power? You need that almighty creative power. Alexander was painting scenery that Bob was familiar with, and he was using a centuries-old painting method called a la prima, which means direct painting, or all at once. The basic premise is that a thin paint will stick to a thicker paint. Alexander called it the wet-on-wet -wet technique. Years ago, Bill taught me this fantastic technique, and I feel as though he gave me a precious gift, and I'd like to share that gift with you. This method allows you to layer colors of paint on top of one another and blend them right on the canvas. Traditional oil painting requires you to wait for each application to dry before adding a new color. But the wet-on-wet -wet technique is more user-friendly because it allows you to paint very quickly, and if you make a mistake, you can just blend it away. Because as you know, we don't make mistakes. In our world, we only have happy accidents. And very quickly, very quickly, you learn to work with anything that happens on this canvas. Anything. 
This painting style was exactly what Bob was looking for. I remember when he was in the Air Force up in Alaska. We went up there and uh, he was excited about um, watching someone on television and he says, that's what I want. I want to paint before the bubble bursts. I want to get my painting on the canvas before I lose my idea. About 1975, I saw Alexander on television and like millions of other people, I fell in love with him. And it took me about a year to find him. I studied with Bill and when I retired from the military, they offered me a position with the Magic Art Company as a traveling art instructor. Bob's wife Jane and his son Steve stayed in Alaska for a couple more years until Jane was eligible for retirement. So she allowed Bob to leave Alaska with a thousand dollars and told him to either go out and make his fortune or come back home. He promised her, I'll go and do this. If it doesn't work, I'll come back home and do domestic stuff and be a good husband and father. And so she stayed in Alaska and waited. Although he was leaving the land of snow-covered mountains, they left an indelible mark on Bob. I lived in Alaska for about a dozen years. And they have some of the most beautiful mountain scenery there that I've ever seen. Absolutely gorgeous. That breathtaking scenery would serve as his inspiration for the rest of his life and would eventually become Bob's signature subject. He took that thousand dollars and set out to try and spread the joy of painting. Bob was teaching Bill Alexander classes all over the country. He happened to land one in his native state of Florida. And that's how he met Annette Kowalski in one of his painting workshops. And Bob's life would never be the same. I had just lost a child and was still in mourning. My husband would have done anything to pacify me and make me happy. So he said, okay, I'll drive you to Florida, which is the only place you can take a Bill Alexander class. So I called the Alexander Company in Oregon and they said, yes, we have some classes in February. Unfortunately, Bill Alexander has retired and there's this guy named Bob Ross who's teaching his classes and I was so unhappy. Annette enrolled in a seminar that was five full days of painting. During that five days, I became aware of an effect that Bob was having on these students very calming effect, very quiet. I had never seen anything like it. I was mesmerized by him. He kept insisting that there was some, something there that had to be packaged or bottled. And that's what I was hearing almost every single night as we had dinner. And I think that was the driving force. So the last day that we were in Florida on a Friday night, we went to a local hamburger joint and we invited Bob to join us. And he agreed. And I said to Bob, I sure wish you would come to Washington, D.C. and teach a class. So he said, OK, OK, I'll do that. So Bob quit working for the Alexander Magic Company and formed a partnership with Walt and Annette Kowalski, who were living in Northern Virginia. Teaching their own painting classes sounded like a good idea, but getting people to enroll wasn't easy. No one had ever heard of Bob Ross. We tried to get Bob into a shopping mall and demonstrate, and in turn try to recruit students for the classes that would occur maybe three days later. We didn't have much success. Even though we ran expensive newspaper ads and paying Bob a salary and no students. They thought maybe the classes weren't filling up because people were working during the day so Bob decided to offer an evening class. One man came to our evening class, and I said, Bob, we're not gonna stay here and teach this one man. And he said, oh yes. And at the end of the class, 
The man said, I'm so impressed with you. The idea that Bob would take the time to teach just me to paint, I'd like to make you a proposition. I'm a businessman, which was his way of saying I have a lot of money. <laughs> I would like to offer you a million dollars. And in return, he wants 40% of what we do for the rest of our lives. They turned down that offer and decided to keep pursuing their dream on their own terms, teaching painting classes in art stores and shopping malls. But they had meager attendance and mounting expenses. One of the ways Bob tried to save money was by getting his straight hair permed. He thought that if he got his hair permed, he wouldn't have to pay for haircuts. And he could save the $1,000 Jane had given him. He was the best man in our wedding. And uh, one day, a number of years later, my kids were looking through our photo album. They kept saying, who is this man in these wedding pictures? I said, well, you know who that is. I said, well, that's Uncle Robert. They said, nah, uh <laughs> And I said, yes, it is. And they said, well, he don't have curly hair here. <laughs> I said, that came later. <laughs> Probably one of the most important things Bob said to me was, if you do what you love, the money will come. Don't think about money. Just do what you like. To me, the, the first step of accomplishing anything is to believe that you can do it. But they needed a next move, a turn in the right direction. So Annette called Bill Alexander and asked him to make a commercial with Bob promoting his classes. I hand over that almighty brush to our mighty man, Bob. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bill. We've had so many cards requesting classes in this area that we've decided to set one up here, and we will have a class going in the near future. We'll produce some almighty painters. But the commercial wasn't recorded on a standard-sized tape. It needed to be converted to a format that television stations could air. So they took the commercial to their local public television station in Northern Virginia, WNVC. When they saw Bob painting on this tape, they got very excited and they came to us and said, wow, this guy is wonderful. Would you agree to do a television series? And we said, would we ever? <laughs> They came up with the idea for a show and called it The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. Hi, I'm Bob Ross, and for the next 13 weeks, I'll be your host as we experience the joy of painting. At the beginning of the show, Bob would start with a blank canvas and finish less than a half hour later with a completed oil painting. Bob told me that he went through every brush stroke in his head when he was in bed at night of how he would execute that painting on TV. Every element of the show was thought out, from Bob's standard long sleeve dress shirt and jeans to the soothing tone of his voice. He said, Annette, these television programs could go on for years. Little did he know. I want to be sure and wear something on television that looks as good 30 years from now as it does now. I think the hair he was a little sorry about and he couldn't change that because we had made a logo out of it. He hated his hair, but it was his trademark and he had to do it. And it really, really bothered him. I talked to him about it a couple of times and said, you know, uh, have you thought about changing your hair? And he said, no, this is my trademark. And he had decided that's what he would look like. And uh, people loved it. What a signature look. Yeah, I mean, he, it's like, Fantastic. Even the simplicity of the set was no accident. It was just a black curtain environment. Uh, Bob and his easel, three cameras. I ran the camera that Bob talked to. Richard's been with me <laughs> since the first series. And as you can see, Richard has finally got smart and he now wears a raincoat. He got tired of all of his clothes being painted. Bob's original idea was to have this elaborate set that looked like a trapper's log cabin, whatever, and this was the original intent. 
But it finally dawned on Bob that he would not create the intimacy with the viewer with all of that in the background. He liked the intimacy of the small space and it, it, it allowed him to feel the kind of intimacy and to sound intimate and be intimate with us, the audience. He said he pretends like he's talking to one woman in bed. I talk to only one person when I'm filming and I'm, I'm really crazy about that person. It's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation and I, I think people realize that and they, they do feel that they know me and I feel that I know them. Bob wanted to publish a how-to book to go along with the Joy of Painting program. WNVC said, I'm sorry, we can't publish the book. If you want a book, you're going to have to publish it. And it was going to cost $30,000. So Walt mortgaged our house, and we published Bob's first book. The book had the same step-by-step -step approach of his television program. They would go on to produce a book for every series of The Joy of Painting, and Bob would dedicate each one to someone meaningful in his life. Bob gets all the credit for these books. After he filmed a painting in front of the cameras, we would then go back home and he would repaint that painting. And I would stand behind Bob with my Canon 35 millimeter camera and he would make me take about 50 photographs the whole time he was painting. And those were the how-to photos that he wanted in that book. Series 1 aired on many public television stations on the East Coast, but the audience was small. In the time you sat around worrying about it and trying to plan a painting, you could have completed a painting already. And the quality of the audio and video was so poor that the first series of The Joy of Painting was never aired again. And the book that goes along with it is a rare find. The partnership with WNBC dissolved. I think we'll call that finished. And I want to thank you very, very much for watching us. I hope to see you again in the near future. Bob would have to look for a new home on public television. With series one of The Joy of Painting under his belt, Bob forged ahead teaching painting classes across the country and looking for a new television station to partner with. Our dream was to move this inland to the Midwest. Walt was tracking where Bill Alexander's program was popular. Those were the cities that we wanted to hit with our classes. Phil Donahue was very big in those days and he was coming out of Chicago. We wanted to run commercials on the Phil Donahue show. But where would we get a commercial? Once again, he turned to public television, this time in Muncie, Indiana, just across the state line from Chicago. In 1981, funding for public television got really bad, and a committee was formed in Congress called the Temporary Committee for Alternate Funding. We called it TCAF. And out of that committee, there became a legislation that allowed for 10 public television stations to actually sell commercials. WIPB was one of those stations. Well, I was sitting in my office, which happened to be in the uh, uh, upstairs bedroom of this uh, television studio, which was an old house. And I look out the window, and this VW bus pulls in the driveway. And we're thinking, hmm, okay. And this bushy-haired man gets out, and this lady with him, and they come walking up to the door. And he says, well, uh, hi. He says, my name's Bob Ross, and we're doing a demonstration and some classes at your mall down the street. And I was wondering if you could give any publicity to us. And I looked at our production manager and I said, have we got a deal for you. WIPB produced a commercial promoting Bob's painting classes and aired it before and after Bill Alexander's program. Walt and Annette also bought airtime on The Phil Donahue Show. All that advertising paid off. The class was such a success 
that Bob thought about making WIPB the permanent home of the joy of painting. So he went to see the general manager. He said, well, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd like to, to uh, talk to you about an idea we have. And I said, what's that? He said, uh, well, would you, would you go to lunch with me? And I said, sure. And so we took him to lunch. He said, how about making a painting series? We did the first one, and he made the painting in basically 26 minutes and 46 seconds. And so we said, well, my goodness, how many of these can you do? And he says, how many do you want to do? I said, well, you realize we could do 13, we'd have a series. So believe it or not, in like a three-day period, we knocked out 13 programs. The next step was to get the joy of painting picked up around the country. So they submitted the series to a national distributor to see if there was enough interest from other stations to carry the program. It went up for a vote and basically Bob and Annette and I and a couple of others were in our office. We were actually watching this vote tally and by golly, you know, it was a hit. They said, oh yeah, we'll take it. They designed a marketing campaign turning over Bill Alexander's technique and his legacy to Bob Ross. I hand over now that almighty brush to an almighty man, and that is Bob Ross. Congratulate you. Thank you very much, Bill. We look forward to seeing you right here on this channel for the joy of painting each week. Now with a national audience, Bob was on the hook to produce a new program series every quarter. The production schedule was grueling. We did the whole 13 programs that would be in a typical quarter in uh, one week here at uh, WIPB. Bob would show up on Sundays. He'd place the paintings actually around the studio in which we're sitting right now. And he'd pick out the order in which he was going to produce them. And we would do the opens and closes of the shows, all of them, on Monday. And then we'd do probably two or three programs on Monday. Um, then uh, Tuesday we'd usually do eight or nine, and Wednesday we'd do what was left. And uh, look at them again on Thursday, and if we had to, we did retakes. The show was generally shot straight through, live to tape. Uh, occasionally, if there was a technical problem or something like that, they would go back and do an edit. But he was producing those paintings as you saw it on television. He was very proud of that, that there, there's no trickery going on. And I should mention here that those paintings were not all that spontaneous. There was always a finished painting hanging off camera that Bob was referring to. Tell you what, let's get crazy today. And he would say all these funny things like, let's get crazy. But he knew where he was going. He knew where he was going, but he's taking you on that ride with him. You know, he's, he's keeping you entertained and painting all at the same time. But Bob insisted that nobody ever see the finished painting because sometimes he didn't have time to do everything that was in that painting and he would have to leave out a big tree or a bush or a boat. There is one exception to Bob's thoughtful planning. He did series two completely off the top of his head. One night, somebody broke into our motorhome two days before we were to start taping. And they stole all 13 of the reference paintings. And that was the most spontaneous series that Bob ever did. This new partnership with the PBS station in Muncie, Indiana was the right move for Bob. He would go on to produce the remaining 30 series of The Joy of Painting there. That's almost 400 episodes. It was a lot of super people that put a lot of work into making this happen. It's not done just by coming up here and, and painting a little picture. A lot of people here in the studio that work very hard to bring you, to bring you a nice production. They really do a good job. It was always fun to work with Bob. It was always a week that I think we looked forward to when he would come back. Bob had a wonderful sense of humor. And so our days were spent more or less telling jokes and goofing off. And then when it came time to be serious and do the show, you know, then the Bob you see on the show is the Bob that we all knew even behind the scenes. And when the work was done, Bob and some of the WIPB team would scour local antique shops for forgotten treasures. By 1984, the joy of painting could be seen in most parts of the country, but some stations still weren't carrying the program. While Bob was teaching classes in upstate New York, 
He gave every one of his students the home phone number of the local PBS station manager to convince him to carry Bob's show. Give your station a call. Let them know. Let them know what you want to see. And when they need some help, give them a hand. Bob's wife Jane came down from Alaska to work with Walt on the business side of things. Jane was very much involved. She did the secretarial work and the office work. We were forever supplying Bob and Annette when they're on, on the road teaching classes, and that's when we were in the basement of our, of our home. I was in college when they started this, you know, crazy thing, and came home one day for Thanksgiving or something, and the house was just transformed. It was no longer home, it was like a warehouse and a shipping dock. At this point, Bob and Annette were on the road teaching painting classes nearly nonstop. As Annette and I have traveled around the country teaching people, we have made so many fantastic friends that have been with us for so long now. And that might truly be the joy of painting, is the friends that you make doing it. But all that travel was necessary for the sake of the business, because teaching painting classes was at the core of what they did. I think we all had a good relationship with, with our spouses, all of us did. But Jane allowed Bob to go out and do what he wanted to do. My wife Jane, she's stood behind us and, and kept this thing going. And it takes a special lady to live with a crazy man. It wasn't fun for them. It wasn't necessarily a lot of fun for us, but the, uh, the encouragement was there from Jane. And certainly I was going to all lengths to uh, <laughs> satisfy my wife as well. The Oprah Winfrey Show called and asked if Bob would agree to appear. And I said, oh yes, should I bring the easel and the canvases and paint? They said, paint? No, we're just looking for couples that are in business together but don't live together. Without the opportunity to paint, Bob turned down a guest appearance on the Oprah Winfrey Show. To Bob, it was all about painting. It's always been about painting with Bob. But the stress of turning this dream into a reality wore on them. And many times, Annette, Walt, or Jane talked about throwing in the towel. Fortunately, there was never a consensus. Not, <laughs> not all four of us agreed at the same time, so it just sort of went on, and then this would shift. Those who objected or wanted to quit before were in favor, and then the others would switch over and decide, let's cash it in, you know? So. But Bob's persistence kept them all going. Well, he never wanted to quit. No, he never, he was probably one of them. And I was the one who most wanted out. His complete dedication to painting and teaching others to paint was the driving force. What ultimately led to Bob's unprecedented success hosting a painting program was his unwavering belief that anyone could learn to paint. You often hear that uh, to be an artist, you have to be blessed with your own talent. I think Bob sort of reversed that notion. Anybody can paint. He said, just a little bit of practice and anybody can paint. You know, just recently I was doing a demonstration in a mall and I had a man come to me and he said, Bob, I can never paint because I'm colorblind. All I can see is gray tones. So I thought today we'd do a picture in gray just to show you that anyone can paint. That's the miracle of Bob Ross. He starts very simply and it just layer and layer and he builds and anyone can do it. That was part of the magic, Bob's unyielding encouragement. He said all you need is a desire to take that first step. I remember putting my knife up for the first time and just shaking. From where I came from with absolutely no background in art, not knowing anything about brushes, paints, canvases, I didn't know anything. And I actually sat down in front of the canvas and did something. I was amazed that what I could do. It's brought painting to the, or the ability to create something to the average person. And, you know, they know they're never going to be a famous artist, I think. Maybe they will be. But when they sit down, they just, they just get into their own world. And it's a nice place to get. 
Bob nurtured the confidence of his viewers, and for many people, painting gives them a feeling of accomplishment. And that's part of the joy that Bob was trying to spread. There is joy in that, in painting and, and creating something and being proud of it. And you can see the looks on people's faces when they're proud of their painting. It's like they just can't believe they did that. You feel so important when you're doing that. You know, when you're putting that paint on that canvas, you are doing something that up until that moment was in a couple of tubes and, uh, and a blank canvas sitting there. I mean, it, it, it wasn't doing anything for anyone. And you're taking those same exact things and for, with just a little bit of energy, you, you've taken this and made it into a creative and wonderful thing. But the fact that a first timer can achieve immediate success using the wet on wet technique is part of the criticism. Traditional artists chastise the method as being overly simplistic. And some say his landscapes use color combinations not found in the natural world. Most people think that art is something that's very complicated that you have to go to school for a hundred years to learn. And we try to teach them that, that you can do a very good painting with very little instruction, uh, a lot of happiness, and teach him how to create. People don't believe that he had any uh, real talent, that he just put paint on a canvas. In actuality, he does everything that traditional artists do. He just doesn't talk about it. He just doesn't talk about it. He doesn't say, he doesn't use the word perspective. He'll say, make the color light in the distance. I think the hardest part with painting is um, is knowing the balance, you know, where the, the foreground and the background and, you know, not putting things in the middle. And, of course, when you watch what he does as a professional, you realize that, you know, he, he does all of that for you. He, but he's not telling you, okay, these are the rules. You don't, you don't do this, you don't do that. He just automatically does it. But Bob never let the critics get to him because it was not his goal to be regarded as a great artist or even to teach others to be. You say out loud, your work will never hang in a museum. No. Bob! Well, maybe it will, but probably not the Smolny. Because just... why, Bob? What's the deal here? What are you telling us? Well, I'm trying to teach people a form of art that anybody can do. This is art for anyone who's ever wanted to put a dream on canvas. It's not something, it's not traditional art, it's not fine art, and I don't try to tell anybody it is. His goal was to get people to experience the joy of painting. And he did that by removing the fear of failure. I think that's probably the main ingredient of, of Bob's technique, that he, that he dismissed that sort of fear of, of beginning. I think that you have to believe in yourself. And you need the confidence and the belief to carry on. I'd probably say he's done more for art than anyone in the history of art. He's gotten more people involved just because of his nature and he told them they could do it, and they can. Bob even acknowledged those criticisms in a spoof he did as an HBO filler to run between movies. Bob interrupts a formal art class when he comes to paint the house. When the class takes a break, Bob gives it a try, using his own tools. With each series of The Joy of Painting, Bob's familiar image and soothing voice filled more and more homes across the country. I think our first series, we managed 50 stations around the country. And probably for the next two or three years, we didn't rise much beyond 75 of the public channels. And then sort of exponentially, we went to 300. It's on almost every station in the country still. It's like 95% of stations, which is the highest of any of the art programs. But most people who watch The Joy of Painting are just watching. The Bob Ross Company estimates that only around 3% of the show's audience actually paints along with him. Millions and millions of people watch him all over the world, and only a small percentage actually paint. They watch him because they just enjoy him. I hear people to this day say, you know, I watched that just so that I can hear his voice. My method of viewing Bob Ross was definitely turn on the TV, 
and watch and listen and just be captivated. Um, I couldn't possibly lift a brush while Bob Ross was talking or working because you just get so sucked into what he's doing. And it was amazing because his subject matter didn't vary too much, but it never got old. It never ceased to amaze me. Every day I just come home from school and I like I really unwind when I watch his show. He's just like semi enchanting. He he really he really puts like a good feeling into my heart. It's fantastic. The secret to Bob's success was Bob himself. His warmth and gentleness were sincere, but once he got in front of the camera, he was well aware that his personality was part of the show. His manner, uh, he just seemed like the happiest guy in the world. I think that, for me, was very powerful, seeing him and, and his happiness. And the things that he used to say, you know, and the, the ways that he would always talk about the world, and the, you could see the way he saw the world. You just get swept off into this magical world where you're taken out of the present moment and you're taken into, you know, a, a fantasy reality. And, and uh, yes, it's his, but it can become your own. You can make up stories, huh? because this is your world, and in your world, you can have any fantasy that you want. Bob cultivated a relationship with his viewers by engaging them in a one-sided conversation. If you think about what Joy of Painting was, it's TV death, right? It's a dude speaking softly and painting a picture, but it's one of the most beloved shows ever. The instinct when you go on television, you see that red light go on, you know, is blah, 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 entertain the people. The worst thing that would happen to me was a moment of silence. And all of a sudden comes along Bob Ross. Who's gonna put a little white cloud here? You know, and I remember thinking, how did this guy get a show? And although Bob was speaking slowly and calmly, he was painting rapidly. You know, Bob Ross, for, for as mild as he was, he painted like a bulldog, you know? I mean, he really like got in there and was just, I mean, he worked that canvas, he worked that paint. He expected a lot out of his materials and he got it. You know, I, there's things you pick up watching him, like the way to do a pine tree with the, the fan brush where you just, you know, go straight up, get the little trunk and then you, you do little pieces all the way down with the fan brush and, it, and it's so fast. And the next thing you know, he takes a brush and he does a couple of, of swirls with gray and black and white, and they're rocks. It was like so quick what he was doing, and uh, it's fascinating to watch. Bob had a passion for life. And of course, he had a Corvette, and he loved that Corvette. And a passion for wildlife. He was known for having small animals, or critters as he liked to call them, on his show. This was not something we were happy with or uh, encouraged, but we allowed him to do it because Bob was Bob. We had lots of creatures on the show. And squirrels, of course, became his trademark. He really loved squirrels and he had Peapod. That's the one that just became famous. And um, Peapod lived in his house with him for about two years. And finally, he said, you know, he really needs to be out in the wild. And so he released him. Bob was committed to rehabilitating injured or orphaned animals, and he would build elaborate cages for them. Actually, I lived a couple blocks from him. And every now and then, he'd say, oh, I made you a cage today. And he would have made me one of these enormous wire cages. And they were lifesavers. They helped me so much. Bob rented an apartment in Muncie near the television studio. It had a lake right out the back door filled with fish, and Bob would feed them every day. Well, Bob had a heart attack while we were in Muncie. And he was bedridden for quite some time. And he worried about those fish. I stayed in Muncie with him while he was sick. So he said, Annette, you have to go by the bread and feed the fish. But even when he wasn't feeling well, Bob always tried to stay positive. He was always up. I mean, he was a person that 
I, and I know he had bad days. He used to have terrible headaches. And I know that, you know, he'd have bad days, but you would not know it if you didn't know Bob Ross. He rose to stardom on the wings of public television, and he wanted to give back to the system that had given him so much. Most of these paintings are donated to PBS stations across the country. They auction them off, and they make a happy buck for them. So if you'd like to have one, you know, get in touch with your PBS station. You know, NBC or ABC gets a thousand phone calls about a program, and they say, oh, okay, we'll note that. PBS gets a half a dozen phone calls from you with a pledge especially. They shut down and have a party. I'll never forget at an auction one time, we were, he was painting a painting live. And we sold it, and the person that bought it said, I'm coming in, will you wait for me so I can meet you? And the woman walked in with her walker about 11.30 at night, and they'd driven for about an hour to get here. And she started crying. And she said, you know, I don't have too many good days anymore, but when I watch your show, it's the best part of that day. And I just want to thank you for that. That's why I had to have your painting. And Bob thanked her and gave her a hug. And he said, that's why I do this. But at this point, the main source of income for Bob's business came from teaching painting classes and selling instruction books. And then a happy accident. The Alexander Company called and said they couldn't produce enough paint to keep up with the growing demand and suggested that Bob start his own line of products. Bob also took that opportunity to refine the product that Alexander had been using. He reduced the size of the largest brush that Alexander was using from two and a half inches down to two inches, and he adjusted the formula of the paint. Bob was very adamant about what he wanted. He was kind of a perfectionist, because he knew the system that he developed would work for a beginner if it was formulated a certain way. More than the colors being specific are, um, is the consistency of the paint. It's very specific to the technique. They're very, very firm. Here's what it takes to make the Bob Ross landscape oil colors. You measure, you put it in, you let it mix, and then thicker products go over a three-roll mill. Then the lab uh, chemist comes and uh, does a drawdown on it. And then if he approves it, then it goes to the tube filling equipment. Each tube of paint was printed with Bob's smiling face. As his products hit the commercial shelves, so did his image, establishing his brand in the commercial art world. Now Bob could focus on growing his business, and that meant training some instructors to go out and teach the method and the message of the joy of painting. As the demand for more television episodes, plus more painting classes, both steadily increased, Bob began to realize that he wouldn't have enough time to devote to both. In 1987, he created the first team of Bob Ross instructors. These students would go out and teach in Bob's place. One of the things that we're trying to do as we travel around and teach this almighty method is we're trying to gather up an army of teachers. And soon we'll have teachers that travel this entire beautiful country teaching this fantastic method of painting. Seminars and demonstrations gave way to guest appearances in big cities. When he released his first hardcover book in 1989, Bob hit the talk show circuit. My next guest has been creating his magic for the past 10 years on his own show, The Joy of Painting, which I watch all the time. He is the author of several books on the subject. His latest is called The Best of the Joy of Painting. Please welcome America's favorite art instructor, Bob Ross. <laughs> Most people can't paint, yet I find myself fascinated. I sit and watch you paint. 
I think, I think it's because it, magic really does happen in 30 minutes, and there's no editing to these shows. What, what happens really happens. What is the easiest thing to paint? If somebody wants to start out, somebody in the audience or me, what would be the first thing you would say probably, to somebody? Probably just a little landscape, because nobody knows if a tree is incorrect. If you put three eyes on there, either you're Picasso or something's wrong. So, sh show me, show me. You know, it's very funny. You think that Bob would pull up in some big limousine and he would jump out and the paparazzi would be clippering, clip, clip, clip. But in fact, we were like dragging easels and we were just a, a bunch of country folk just in the big city. He was also invited to be a celebrity guest at the Grand Old Opry. Bob was a big fan of country music and his friend Hank Snow brought him up on stage. And when they introduced him, the crowd just went nuts. And he went up there and he was a little nervous at first and he cracked a joke and everybody laughed and they cheered and he was on his way and they had a great interview and it was just a really cool thing to walk in there and have all these country music stars come up to Bob and say, oh, you're my favorite, I watch you all the time, I paint with you. Annette Kowalski and I had a private class for one of country and western's living legends, Mr. Hank Snow. I've learned more in the last couple of days than I could learn in a year, really. Well, thank you. Shoot, you're doing almighty pains there. By the early 90s, nearly 300 episodes of The Joy of Painting were on the air in the U.S. and then Canada. Soon, translations started cropping up in Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Turkey, Iran, South Korea, and Japan. When it was on in Japan, they said, uh, they said, no, no, take the soundtrack back up. We've got to hear his voice. Uh, I think his sincerity came across, even if you didn't understand the words. By now, Bob was arguably one of the biggest stars in the history of public television and host of the most popular art show of all time. It's just, wow. This, this guy has got it. And that's kind of what the, what the way it was. But he didn't let it go to his head, not at all. I mean, he would never know that he had this program that clearly had the attention nationally of people because he was just kind of under the radar. When his second hardcover book came out, Bob was once again called up to the networks. Bob is looking at us and he's painting a mountain. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He does. He's famous for his landscapes. He says millions of people harbor a desire to paint, and I think he's right. Wouldn't I, you love to be able to? Well, you know, we've talked about this before. I frankly have no, there's his book. I have no... Um, Artistic talent at all? Absolutely none. <laughs> none. <laughs> Tell you what, if, if I can get you to pick up your palettes. Uh, we have a palette prepared for That's each other. That's this part, Reach. <laughs> and just sort of put your thumb right through the hole there. There you go. Hold it. Oh, you look good. Look okay. Good. Now, this is the fun part of all this. Yeah. We're just going to paint a happy tree right here. Hey, She's look what I'm wonderful. doing here. I'm Don't... painting. All right. Bob rose to the status of pop culture icon with a series of promotional spots for MTV. I do love to paint trees. You can make it wiggledy. So here's to it. MTV, it's all just fluffy white clouds. And a tongue-in-cheek commercial for hair care products. It's subtle color. A little bit of color. And there's no ammonia or peroxide. It even conditions your hair. You know, people have done spoofs on Saturday Night Live. They've done all sorts of things. and. You know, what can I say? If you reach that stature, it, it means something in life, whether you actually like what they're doing or not. The point is that they know who you are. And he certainly had made a, a reputation of being a visible icon. But Bob learned just how popular he was while demonstrating his products on QVC. When he got off the air, a producer walked up to Bob and handed him a phone. He said, Bob, I got somebody on the phone who wants to talk to you. And Bob said, who's that? He said, Marlon Brando's on the phone who wants to talk to you. Bob, who's very humble, he was like, his jaw dropped. He just like, Marlon Brando wants to talk to me. And it, it was phenomenal. I mean, that's the kind of magnet Bob was. Although his career was at its pinnacle, his personal life was starting to come apart. In 1992, he lost his wife Jane to cancer and his own health was starting to fail as well. He was fighting his second bout of lymphoma. He'd had surgery for the original diagnosis long before the joy of painting started and had been in remission for years. 
all of which was kept secret except to his closest friends. He really got tired easily, and that probably was a precursor to what was coming. But when Bob knew he was losing the fight, he began making plans to carry on the joy of painting. We had a couple of years warning that we were going to lose Bob. He worried that when he was gone, the landscapes would go too. And so he said, Annette, I think you need to go public with the florals that you're painting. You know, over the years, I've got literally hundreds of letters from people saying, teach us how to paint florals. Well, I'm not really a floral painter. I'm really a, a tree and mountain type person. So I've asked a very dear friend to come in today and help us with a little floral painting. I'd like to introduce you to my partner and longtime friend, Annette Kowalski. Annette, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. Around that same time, they opened the Bob Ross Workshop in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, to train the army of new instructors to carry on Bob's legacy. It's viral. It's, it's you teach five people to do it, and they go out and they teach 10 people to do it, and then they teach 20 people to do it, and it just keeps rolling. That's what he wanted to happen, is that everybody would still pass that joy on to the next person. Then in 1994, about a year before he died, Bob was invited to be a guest on The Phil Donahue Show. I recall thinking, you know, when people watch The Donahue Show, you know, we hope we're interesting and, you know, people will watch it and enjoy it. When they watched Bob Ross, they went like this. You were mesmerized by what he was doing. I remember just leaning forward to the, toward the television set. I couldn't get over this guy. I was crazy about the guy. So, what do you do when you're impressed? You <laughs> invite him on your show, which is what I did. You know, you don't necessarily jump out of a cake. I mean, you never were that kind of guy no. who put a lampshade on your head. No. And what's just, you know, you are so cool, you are so calm, you are yourself, and you put together some of the most beautiful work I've ever seen. Look at the light shining. I mean, this is wonderful. And so, who's stupid to put his painting up after Bob Ross, the, the pro? All right, here I am. I'm about to embarrass the whole Donahue family here. All right, this is what you can do if you apply yourself and have more talent than I do. There you go. Oh. <clears throat> The audience was just totally into this. And, uh, you know, when you're 29 years on the air with an audience every day, you get pretty good at reading audiences. And this audience, on the, at the time that he did our show, was totally wrapped. Sir, you wanted that. Oh, my mom watches him all the time. Yeah. I go over there, she's always watching this guy paint. And yeah. she says, he looks so good. I wonder how they look in person. And they look terrific, Mom, in person. They oh, look great. Thank you. Uh, Bob, thank you. By the end of 94, Bob became too weak to continue to travel to Indiana from his home in Florida. And it was pretty clear as he started dealing with those issues that doing four or five shows in a matter of three or four hours was just getting to be too much. Um, and that's when we really just started saying, we, we need to stop. The, the worst part of all for him was his hair. He, he was so upset because his hair, you know, he did go through a certain amount of radiation and chemo, and his hair was falling out, and he, of course he had a wig at the end there, but, um, you know, he had an image to keep, and that was very important to him. He had produced over 400 episodes of The Joy of Painting. The last series was number 31. Bob was unable to complete series 32. I think he prepared 10 or 12 of the paintings, um, and then he couldn't paint anymore, and so we were never able to film or tape those programs, but we do still have the paintings. After he stopped recording The Joy of Painting, 
Bob went home to Florida and remained very private in his final months. Bob's life had always been about sharing the joy of painting with others. And even as his life was coming to an end, he wanted to find a way to share his love of painting and wildlife with children. And so he teamed up with a crew from Muncie to produce a children's program called The Adventures of Elmer and Friends. But he was too ill to travel to Indiana to shoot the pilot. So the crew came to Florida and recorded Bob's parts from his home. I'll bet the trees and animals knew all about old Walter's treasure, like it says. But how does that help us? I think you should talk to a tree. Talk to a tree? We don't know any trees. Oh, yes, we do. How about the happy little tree? The happy little tree? You mean the one Bob always paints? Yeah, that's a great idea. We could ask him about the diamonds. But where is he? He's in your imagination. But there might be a picture of him in this book. It was really heartbreaking when we walked in and saw Bob because we hadn't seen Bob in so long. He'd lost a lot of weight, he'd lost a lot of hair, just not the Bob Ross that we knew. And God bless Bob, he had the spirit and he had the willingness to do it. Whether or not he had the energy was irrelevant. In the end, Bob was only able to participate in the pilot episode. On July 4th, 1995, Bob Ross died of lymphoma. He was 52 years old. He really touched a lot of people and um, uh, made a difference in their lives. And I think the painting made a difference, but what he said made a difference. I think we are all looking for hope in life even today and, uh, and will always be. And I think he was selling hope as much as he was selling painting. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man, and we're, we were so lucky to have him come and spend the time that he did with us. He was our friend. He was our, he was our best friend. Bob's legacy lives on through the thousands of instructors who teach his method. When I'm painting, I feel like he's there with me, guiding me. Um, it's <laughs> so funny. It's an emotional thing. I can't, I can't describe how emotional painting can be for people and for me. We continue to certify teachers at the same rate as when he was alive. There's probably 2,000 of them now, and they're all over the world. And Bob himself still lives on through his TV series, The Best of the Joy of Painting. Blue Ridge PBS in Roanoke, Virginia presents the program to America's public television stations, where more than 90% of the country can still watch Bob paint happy little trees each week. Who knew that, like, 30-some-odd years later, the shows are still running on TV? You know, I mean, that's just fantastic. There was a lot of pressure on us right after we lost Bob to replace him with another painter. And we talked about it. I think the smartest decision we ever made was not to replace Bob with anybody else. He just will live forever. This is 28 years later now, and I can tell you the phone calls that we get today are identical to the calls we were getting 28 years ago. This is a new generation of viewers now. I don't think he understood, I don't think a lot of people understand the age range and the lives he's touched. College students, young kids, old, middle of the road. It's incredible. But yet the one thing is that man's legacy does not go away, nor should it. What he's given, many people have imitated, never duplicated. But what a ride it was. I miss him. And I'm sure his millions of fans do as well. Until next time, on behalf of all the personnel here, my partners, Walt Lynette Kowalski, I'd like to wish you happy painting. God bless, my friend. The thing I love the most about it is he'll go, oh, and then we'll you know, put a little tree in here, you know, do, 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 and you know, maybe it needs a friend. 
and maybe another friend. You know, I, I just love that. And you'd see like there'd be a part of the canvas that's done and, and he would be like, oh, I'm gonna put this here. And all of a sudden there's a cottage. Where, where did that come from? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I agree with Bob on that, that anyone can paint. I think anyone can do it and anyone can enjoy it. So in that sense, anybody should. Um, you know, we've been, I've seen some paintings that shouldn't have happened. <laughs>